Shouting out the time is nigh as the father tells the son work on earth this is done son go bring my children home for I want them gathered around Son, go bring my children home. What a joy to see his face. In his arms we will embrace. Never more we'll have to go. For we finally Son, go bring my children home, for I want them gathered around my throne. It's time to reap the harvest you have sown. Son, go bring my children home. It's time to reap the harvest you have sown. Son, go bring my children home. Amen. Amen. Beautiful song. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Randy. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 14 tonight. Romans chapter 14. We don't have to wait on the uh, Master Club to get out at 8.30. And so uh, I'll be very brief tonight. We'll go to nine. No, not really. <laughs> Amen. And all God's people walked out. Amen. <laughs> Understand. Y'all are tired, and it's been a hot day, and a lot of you had a hot working day, and I appreciate you being here so much. Appreciate our song leader being here. His air condition's out. And so I heard that Brother Gary Brewer is going into full-time air condition repair. <laughs> And, and so, <laughs> oh boy, he's going to have to get right with God before he hears this message. Cause I know what he went through yesterday. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> he's, he has no air conditioning, so <clears throat> uh, ushers don't turn the air conditioning off. He'll be sleeping on his front pew <laughs> after, after, during, <laughs> during the night, amen. <clears throat> we'll have security on site. <clears throat> That'll be a blessing. Excuse me, pollen. Amen. You know, I woke up this morning, or maybe it was last night I heard, it might have been this morning, a little two-year-old that was grabbed by that um, um, alligator in the sight of his daddy. I can't imagine what his daddy's going through, how he tried to probably rescue his, his son. <clears throat> and, you know, it's just, it's just heartbreaking, some of the things that people have to go through, and I can't imagine them going through that without the Lord. Amen. And so you pray for that family. And any death is um, is tragic. But I was asking Stephanie how old her little boy was, 20 months old. And this little boy was just 24 months old. And he was wading in about six inches of water when that alligator ripped him out of that, in that man-made lagoon <clears throat> at Disney World. And I don't know what's going on with Disney World but <clears throat> and Orlando and all that's going on. But I believe God's trying to tell us something. And I don't know what that is. I'm not going to presuppose but I know one thing, we need to know that God's coming. The Lord's coming. Uh, that, that was a great series. Matter of fact, I was so thrilled that some of you wanted to take it home and listen to it again. And uh, I would really appreciate <clears throat> the interest and the response. Now, I'm going to preach and read the whole chapter, so I'm just going to read one verse as our text. If you'll stand on the Word of God, I'll just let you stand in one verse. And I believe it summarizes the whole the whole chapter, verse 17 of Romans chapter 14, verse 17. <clears throat> but if anybody knows anything about air conditioning, please go home with Brother Randy. Amen. He'll, he'll, he'll appreciate it. He'll give you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich before you fix it. And Brother Gary Brewer just left. Okay, verse 17, Romans chapter 14. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace 
and joy in the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you something. There's a lot of people that are splitting a lot of hairs, pardon the expression, on some minor things like what to eat, what to drink, and even what days that they ought to do this and do that. And of course, we know that this was all Judaism. It was all law keepers trying to mix law with grace. And so Paul tells the Christians how to handle and how to love concerning doubtful things and through the weaker brethren. And the new converts that we have, they don't know anything yet. And so we got to be careful about how we disciple them and how we come across. And uh, I think sometimes independent Baptists can be the world's worst of being intolerant. And my question is to you, <clears throat> how long did it take you to get spiritual? Amen. And it's only the grace of God if you are spiritual. And so we should never be pious and judgmental. I think this chapter will help us all. You may be seated as I pray. Father, we do pray for those that's going through horrendous times. I can't imagine, I can't imagine what the family's going through down in Orlando. I don't care how many counselors they bring in or how many meals they try to serve them or what kind of uh, peace they might try to give them. But dear God, they need you at this time. And God, I would need you to keep my sanity. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that you give them peace that passes understanding and grace. I don't know them. They're from Nebraska. But God, I think we ought to pray for them like they're family. We ought to pray for everybody like they're family. Like we love them personally and care about them personally. Because it could be personally one of us that goes through such tragedies. And so, Lord, I pray that you give this whole country grace as we're being attacked. And God, I pray that you'd give the uh, president wisdom, uh, the judicial system, wisdom, uh, our legislature and Congress and senators' wisdom to do the right things uh, to defeat this attack from Satan in these last days. And God, we know this is all signs of the time that you're coming soon. And Lord, we just say, even so, come quickly. And so Lord, help us in these last days to learn how to disciple better, how to uh, uh, care for people better, how to, Lord, just... Uh, be more loving and kind and considerate towards those that are young in the Lord and immature. And Lord, we'll praise you for the wisdom you give us to deal with people. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You know, this chapter is about love concerning doubtful things, or love concerning weak brethren. And our theme verse, or our text, is for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know, church rituals, and we had the Lord's Supper Sunday night, and it was such a blessing to observe the Lord's Supper. I'd come uh, every first Sunday night just to take the Lord's Supper if there was no preaching here. Because it represents the blood and it represents the body. It reminds us that we ought to do this in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ till He comes. <clears throat> but, you know, I want to tell you something. A lot of people believe that through that wafer you're saved. And a lot of people have substance and shadows and types and symbols, and they're hung up on that. Uh, just two blocks up the road, this Buddhist uh, temple that's going to be erected, they have this big tall statue and flowers around it, and, and I thought to myself, how impersonal, how hard, how cold that must be to worship an image, an idol. And friend, I want to tell you something, the world's hung up on worshiping images and idols and people and things and feelings. And folks, the fact today is that there's many that are weak in the faith, that they're lacking altogether in the faith, and their, their weakness is probably not just being new Christians, but it's carnality. And uh, th these folks were keeping the law, which was a problem here, and they were hung up on shadows and symbols, and they needed the book of Hebrews. And I believe Paul wrote that book, and I believe he dealt with Judaizers. But first of all, I want you to notice in verse 1 of chapter 14, the Bible says, Him that is weak in faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disp de disp dispensation. Now what that's saying is this, love, but don't compromise. Amen? You know, I believe tough love, like I preached on discipline Sunday night, and a lot of the children uh, look like they're mad at me tonight, because I preached on that you ought to, seven admonitions of, that you ought to spank your children, and teaching them this, that the consequences of sin is far worse than the pleasures of sin. And the Bible even says that you'll keep your child from going to hell 
because they'll understand what sin is and get saved. They'll understand what authority is and they'll listen. And folks, every child needs that. I want to tell you something, friend. This daddy that's being interviewed by this Muslim that killed uh, 49 people unmercifully while they were laying in the floor, kept on shooting them. Uh, I would hate to have to be interviewed, and I wouldn't take any interviews if I was the daddy. But he's trying to tell them that he was a perfect son all up in his up raising and that he just turned all of a sudden. And uh, that could happen through demon possession. But I want to tell you something. A lot of times it happens in the childhood when there's, not, there's a poor self-image and a poor image of God. But I want to tell you something, friend. We need to realize that weak, weak vessels don't need to get put down. and They don't need to be cast out. They don't need to be talked about, and they don't need to be rebuked. What they need is love. Uh, how long did it take you to grow spiritually? Thank you, Brother Larry. Uh, you know, and so I believe that this word receive ye means fellowship. It involves fellowship with weak Christians without scorn. Without rebuke. Uh, I, I think one of the greatest verses in the Bible on how God treats us is the way we ought to treat others. I want you to turn to your Bibles to uh, James chapter 1 and verse 5, I believe it is. It might be 4, but look at it. James chapter 1 tells us how Jesus treats us when we make a mistake, when we're confused, when we're weak, when we're carnal, when we're uh, maybe indifferent, uh, when we're just confused. As a termite and a yo-yo. It says, count it all joy when you fall in divers temptation. And then it says, knowing this, that the trying your faith, verse 3, worketh patience, but patience having her perfect work, that it may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. That means you just grow up spiritually. But here's how God treats people that are confused. Here's how God treats people that are, that are carnal. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men how? liberally. That's the only way God's liberal in the way He gives you blessings from heaven and wisdom from heaven. And look at this next phrase. It says, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so folks, the whole problem with immaturity and the whole problem with lack of separation is one word, lack of faith and lack of fear. We ought to fear God and we ought to realize that God is a patient God. Can somebody say amen right there? God is very patient. And if you have children, you'll learn patience. I'm keeping, uh, I'm keeping, I, I'm hanging around Miss uh, Mimi keeping three grandchildren. And I want to tell you something, even the noise level in the car is, is shocking to me now that I've got so old. And I'm saying, can y'all not at least talk instead of holler? You know, holler is a South Georgia word, raising your voice. And I use this thing because Mama did. I said, inside voices. It didn't work for me. Praise God, inside voices got higher and got louder. And I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I believe that we need to realize that we need to have patience with our own children. We need to have patience with children. Uh, a couple of times uh, uh, yesterday, my wife said, they're just children, honey. I think what she's saying is, you know, calm down, it'll be all right, you know, amen. You ain't going to have a nervous breakdown yet. And I hope that uh, there is sleep in South Africa, amen, or they'll think I'm not enjoying their children. And that was a great surprise, and it's a miracle that I kept that secret. Matter of fact, I posted them hugging, and they all rebuked me in one accord, said, take it off, Daddy, Emily, Luke, Addie, all the kids don't know we're coming, take it off. So I took it off. Amen. Never to post anything again. But I want to tell you this. <laughs> Upbraideth not. Upbraideth not means God does not fuss at you. I want to tell you the worst thing you can do is when a child comes to you broken and they need advice and they need help and you fuss at them. He said, I told you ten times, boy, what you was going to get into. And you fuss at them and rebuke them and slaughter their character and slaughter their self-image because they made a mistake. No, friend, I'm going to tell you something. You need the patience of God. You need the patience of God with new converts. You need the patience of God with people that fall into sin. You need the patience of God to upbraid not. That means you don't scold them. Now, I don't, mean, I don't believe in compromise. You know that. I have high standards for leadership around here. We try to have because I believe we ought to lead by example. Amen? I believe we ought to lead by example. And if your testimony is not right, then how in the world can you lead? Because you're just talking the talk, not just... 
uh, and not walk in the walk, which gets the job done. But I see in the area of diet. Oh, that's a four-letter dirty word, isn't it? But look at, look at verse. I've been, uh, as Brother Wallace often said, I, he said, Brother Wayne, you've been on a diet since I've known you. Amen. I'll never forget that. He said that shortly right before he went to heaven. And when I get to heaven, he's going to say, did you ever go on that diet? I said, I'm on one now. But look at this. Chapter 2, or, or, or chapter 14 of Romans, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, excuse me. It says, For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. They're just a vegetarian. Now that would be boring. And it says, but you would have no sinus problems, by the way. But look at verse uh, 3. Let not him that eateth despises him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God has received him. Now what in the world is that talking about? Eating? No. It's talking about eating things that are sacrificed to idols. And folks, I want to tell you something. Uh, these these uh, Pharisees wouldn't touch any meat because they're afraid that that meat might have been raised or or butchered or whatever to sacrifice to some ungodly god, uh, some heathen god, some image. And then we see in the area of days in verse 4 through 6, the Bible says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own uh, master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man steameth one day above another, and uh, another esteemeth every day alike, and let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that uh, regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God, uh, he giveth God thanks. It means you ought to ask the blessing before you dig in. And it says this, And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, nor giveth God thanks. Now folks, all that's saying is this. Um, and it's not saying that you shouldn't have a set day to go to church. And it's alright to set aside Sunday, the Lord's day as a priority day for worship. But I want to, and a lot of people take these verses out of context. They say, you don't have to do anything, but sit on a log, Brother Larry Reimer. That's what you used to say to me when I first met you. And uh, he says, I get close to God out in the woods and sitting on a log, shooting Bambi and uh, squirrels and all that stuff. And I said, Baloney, you need to be in church, son. And praise God he got in church and he ain't missed since. And thank God for his faithfulness. I told the men at the men's breakfast, I said right after Miss Shirley died, he still came. Amen? I want to tell you something. That took a lot of courage and a lot of conviction. Amen? He didn't miss a beat. He didn't get bitter. He got better. And I'll tell you something. I appreciate him. And he's always here early, and he's always at his post directing the team back there. Amen? We're going to have to get a bigger sound room if we keep growing up there. Amen? It's getting bigger in the choir. Praise God. That's good. And I appreciate it. And we weren't going to start till Cody got here. But anyway, the area of diet, and then the area of days. And folks, all this is talking about the special holy days these special meats that you cannot eat. And it's all types and shadows. It's mosaic law that was devoted, kept faithfully before Calvary. But those mature in the faith knew it was counseled. Maybe not counseled is a good word, but fulfilled at Calvary. Jesus is the last lamb. Say amen. Jesus, the altar, the, uh, the, uh, the hill called Mount Calvary, is the last al altar. And folks, he's the last sacrifice and folks, I want to tell you something. He's a fulfillment of the law, and we, we should not uh, get hung up on what we eat, what we don't eat. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists, they don't eat meat. And I'll tell you what, one time I made the mistake in college of dating a Seventh-day Adventist girl. That was a mistake. It almost cost my relationship with Miss Connie. Or did I know you then? I don't know. It, was, it gets confusing uh, back then. That was, that was in the Civil War when I was dating this girl. And I'm going to tell you something. She took me to an outing. And that was a mistake. I'm a Baptist by conviction. I've been Baptist all my life. Here I was because of a girl going to a place I shouldn't be. And I tell you what, I got out of there real quick when they served me soybean burgers. <laughs> so, I mean, listen, Burger King's my style, praise God. All the meats you can eat, praise God. I went to the um, um, Outback, no, not Outback, picnic shelter. What's it called? Cookout. I see it somewhere in that thing today. Got my grandkids everything but the kitchen sink. But I want to tell you something. I ate a lot of meat. I mean, I ate chicken that they didn't eat. That's, what, that's what's wrong with papas, man. That you, just, you just clean up the leftovers, amen. You can't go on a diet. And I mean, we had uh, chili hot dogs and we had hamburgers. And I thought to myself, thank God I'm not a seven-day Adventist. I'm a fat Baptist. No. <laughs> hey, friend, listen. And I want to tell you something. We ought to realize that it's not the keeping and the not keeping 
It's all uh, shadows and types of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Sabbath. Amen? And He is our bread. Say amen. He is the water of life. And He fulfills us and all we need is Jesus. We don't need religion. We need a relationship with the Lord that makes us religious. Amen. We ought to be religiously faithful and we ought to religiously read our Bibles. But the reason is because we love Jesus. Not because we're trying to earn merit and trying to get spiritual enough to go to heaven as the Seventh-day Adventists and other cults teach. And Islamic, they're really bad about it. You know, this Radama thing, whatever it's called, uh, you can get ten times the virgins if you'll kill somebody during that, during that time on extreme Islamic terrorists. Ten times. That's why the alert's up in this uh, special holiday they have. I visited my next door neighbor who's Jordanians, and uh, they said, we can offer you food, but we're fasting for, for 20 days. I thought, my word, I've never fasted for 20 days. And they're fasting to their false god. And so me and the visitation partner, we didn't know any better. We just sit down there and let them, let them, let them feed us some coconut cake. Lord, have mercy I wouldn't do that again. Amen? And no offense, you know. But I thought about I ought to go over there to, uh, tomorrow and, just, and ask them if they want to get saved. Amen? I mean, folks, we got the truth. They don't have the truth. We take the gospel over the seas. That's why my... Uh, uh, two daughters were so excited about seeing us. They hadn't seen each other in three years. They hadn't seen her home and hadn't seen her mission field. And they were so happy to be there and surprise Emily. And she's squilling and yelling and, and, and Luke's hugging. And folks, only for Jesus would I do that. Or even allowed, not for money. It's the only reason Mark's over there. And as soon as old Trent hit the uh, ground, they had him preaching a youth revival. He, he traveled 37 hours and was hung up in Turkey, and as soon as they hit the ground, you're preaching. I thought, my word, that's just like them. Amen? Brother Kevin puts them to work. Brother Mark puts them to work. But folks, it's only for Jesus. He is, he, well, folks, we're not going to get hung up on these, these, uh, these shadows and substance. Now let me just hurry in about 20 minutes, give you how to deal with weaker brethren. And folks, I want to tell you something. The only way to reach religious people is through love. Did you hear me? Love. You're not going to browbeat them and you're not going to be the prosecuting attorney and prove they're wrong. Have you ever tried to talk to a church of Christ? They're not wrong and they never will be wrong. I know from experience. But I want to tell you something, you can still love them and you can keep on loving them. And one day when everything falls apart, they're going to come to the people that love them. And so you just got to keep on loving them. So the way to reach a religionist and the way to reach a cult and the way, hey, the way to reach a Muslim Let's put it just straight tonight. It's through love. Not through hate. It's not an eye for an eye. I believe in defending yourself. Somebody should have been packing a 44 in that club and they'd have stopped them after and about four people. Maybe nine, but it wouldn't have been 49. Say amen. And you can call it dove if you want to, but I'm going to tell you something. Some, somebody starts shooting my wife and children, they're going down. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And, you, and all you... All you Liberals out there saying, oh, no, I don't think there ought to be any anywhere. Well, I'm going to tell you something. In this day and age, we need some kind of defense. And by the way, if we're going to outlaw guns, let's outlaw planes because the planes took down a whole lot more people than the guns in 9-11. It's the wicked hearts that we need to reach. And we need to reach the hearts that pull the trigger. We need to win souls. And friend, we need to witness to the Muslims and the Buddhists up here. Somebody on visitation ought to go up to that house, that temple, and tell them about Jesus. They're invading our territory. Praise God, we ought to stand strong with what we believe, say amen. And not let the foreigners bring in their ungodly gods. Say amen. And that is a curse in the Bible, by the way. Is that the heathens would bring in their gods and destroy the land. It's a curse. Now, that won't go over politically either. But I'm not running from anything. I just hope I don't put my foot in my mouth like one of them's doing all the time. Amen? God help us. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, chapter 4. First of all, we need exaltation. We need exaltation. What is it all about? It's God's glory. And folks, you can argue if you want to, and you can put down. People in cults if you want to. And you can put down weaker brethren that are worldly if you want to. But it's not going to do a bit of good. What you need to do is love them. 
without compromise. I know some churches that won't even let people come to their church because they don't dress like they do and look like they do, and that's ridiculous. Anybody's welcome to come in this church unless they're wanting to cause trouble, and then we will usher them out. But look at this. Verse 7, Romans 14. We'll just cover this chapter real quick. It says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man died to himself. Now listen. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Here, here's the bottom line, folks. If we're going to help people that are weak, religious, lost, for the glory of God, we've got to love them. And we've got to be patient. And we've got to be persistent. And we've got to be consistent. And then I see also the examination in this argument. Look at verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now look at verse 11. As it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of what? Himself to God. At the judgment seat of Christ, you're not going to give account of all those people that bother you. You're going to give account of yourself to God. Amen? So the main priority is examine this at the, in light of the judgment seat of Christ. If people are weak in the faith, love them and exalt the Lord in front of them. And then number two, it's ex, 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 explicitly and immediately and impartially Pictured to them, God. Don't compromise. You don't jump in a well to rescue somebody. You reach down in love. And you don't condescend and put them down and make fun of them. It's only by the grace of God you was, your mama took you to the right kind of church. Say amen. It's only the grace of God somehow you ended up in an independent fundamental Baptist church that's not going to have uh, conventionism and, and people moving their pastor out every three years, and etc., and etc. It's only the grace of God you're not joining the Presbyterian church where they baptize babies. It's only the grace of God you're not a Muslim. Some of you look like Muslims, so you could be one. I'm telling you, friend, we've got to watch our attitude towards the weak. Because at the judgment seat of Christ, we're not giving account of them. We're giving account of how we love them. And how we glorify God in front of them. And so what we need to do is lift the Lord and love others. Sums it up, don't it? Look at verse 13. Let, let not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in a brother's way. And so folks, we see the endanger, endangering in this argument. The danger of lack of love and dealing with this problem is great. Uh, the danger is new Christians can be hurt badly and not grow in the faith because of your attitude. I once heard a preacher say, I, I praise God we have backdoor revivals in this place. If you don't like what we believe, you can leave. Well, I've never felt that way. I understand some people leave. I checked on one yesterday, and I, and I, and I understood. Still broke, broke my heart. And I want to tell you something, friend. There's, there's sometimes God moves you to other places. That's all right if God's leading you. It's better than getting out of church. Say amen. It's better than going to the world looking for whatever. Folks, look for Jesus. But I want to tell you something, friend. I never am happy with backdoor revival. Let's clean house, bless God. You ever heard that? that? That makes good preaching and everybody thinks they're tough. Like that guy down there at the Rosaka. What's his name? Phil Kid, Bill Kid, Phil Kid, isn't it? I wouldn't walk across the street to hear that joker. He's the most controversial evangelist in the world. And he labels that and tells people off and calls women that wear pants harlots from the pulpit. I've heard it. And, they, and somebody thinks that's cute and thinks that's, that's good preaching. That's not even good politics. <laughs> I think we ought to be the most compassionate evangelist in the world, not the most controversial. 
I think it's a big show, to tell you the truth. Don't get me started there. I'm just saying, friend, you damage a young Christian, you can knock him out of church for the rest of his life. And one of the greatest damages for a new convert is you don't live it. And then when you live it, you condescend on them and put them down and try to get them to be as spiritual as you are. But how long did it take you to be spiritual? We need to come back to Calvary and realize the foot of the, the land, of the, the, the bottom of Calvary's level. We're all sinners. And we need to have forgiveness. We need to manifest the love of God and the forgiveness of God as Jesus did to us. And we need to be patient with new converts. And then I see the equality in this argument. The equality in this argument, verse 14, it says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So it just calls this meat, it's not unclean. It just calls this a Sabbath, it's not unclean. The Jewish people had over 32,000 laws, mosaic laws. They couldn't even keep up with them. They broke so many of them, they couldn't keep up with how many they broke. They were making up laws right and left. The more laws, the better. They had books and books and books of rabbinical laws. And no wonder people got turned off at that stuff. And then I see in verse 15 it says, But if any brother be greed with their, thy meat, now walketh thou not charitably, destroy not him with, that, with thy meat for whom Christ died. And just because he ain't just like you and he don't dress like you and he don't cut his hair like you and he don't dress like you do, ladies, it don't mean that you put them down. You love them. It says, let not then your good be evil spoken of. In other words, be discreet. And if it's a stumbling block to them, don't do it in front of them. But look at this. It's a, here's the emphasis of the whole thing. Our text, verse 17. It says this. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now what in the world does that mean? It means, friend, it's not in ritual and it's not in, in, in uh, ordinances and it's not in baptism and it's not in the way you look and the way you don't look and what you do and what you don't do and what, what days you keep and what meat you eat. It's in being right with God. It's being right with God. And the only way to be right with God is to know that Jesus took your sin that you might have the righteousness of God. It's imputed righteousness. And then the imparted righteousness, as the Puritans say, is letting God be who He is through you. And so, folks, the emphasis is, is just clearly put here, and it says, and joy of the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you something. God didn't call us to be angry, mean Christians. God didn't call us to be critical, cynical Christians. That turns everybody off. That turns your own kids off. God's called you to be full of the Holy Ghost that brings joy and peace and purpose and power and His presence manifested and fruit that abounds. And so I feel sorry for these people that think, that they, the meaner they are, the more, more holy they are. Where'd they ever get that from the Bible? The last time I checked, Jesus was the most kind and He was the most compassionate person that ever walked this earth. And He loved everybody. And we should love everyone. We ought to love all the LBG whatever crowd. Now, I hate the sin. And it's sickening. And they ain't going to get near my grandkids. I'll just be honest with you. I'll counsel with them one-on-one -on -one without, without, without any hesitation. But I want to tell you something, friend. We need to hate the sin but love the sinner. Say amen. And I preach against sin. And I've lost a lot of people because of that over the years. Because I preach against sin. You won't hear that in the party church. But folks, I want to tell you something. At the same time, we better love the sinner. We better love the sinner. Because Christ loves us. And He sure was patient with me when I first got saved. Because I was a rounder and so were you. Peace. Peace with God and peace with others. Let me close real quick. I've seen all the emphasis. And by the way, the weightier manners is what's important. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus rebuked uh, the Pharisees 
for all their law keeping and all their uh, things. He even rebuked their tithing because their tithing was not unto the Lord, but it was to be seen and it was to be uh, looked at as holy. But verse 23, 23, he said, Woe unto you, scribes! Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes, hypocrites! For you pay tithes of, of mint, and anise and cumin and, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. What is the weightier matters? Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought to be have done and not to leave the other undone. So he's saying it's, you should tithe. But folks, don't leave the un, other undone. Tithe because you love Jesus. Give because you love God. Give for His glory, not to obtain a higher standing in the religious circles. And then I see the edification in verse 19. Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. Here it is. You're going to find out you're going to be a very happy person in the Lord if you live to edify others. Magnify God and edify others. And you will be the most popular person around here. Because nobody likes to hang around a cynical, critical, double-tongued person. Who likes to hang around a gossip? Because you just might hear the wrong thing. Or you might even be foolish enough to believe half of it. But boy, don't you like to be around a person that's positive, kind, considerate, uplifting, edifying. I'm not talking about compromising with sin. I'm talking about just giving others a chance in their life to grow. Like somebody gave you a chance. And then it goes on to say, the exhortation in verse 22. Let's just go ahead and read verse uh, 20. For meat destroyeth not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Don't be a stumbling block. Be a stepping stone. And then here it is in closing. We see the exhortation in verse 22. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Let God the Holy Spirit teach you what's right. Don't flaunt it before the weak. Don't boast of your liberty or your maturity. Happiness is being right with God and getting others to be attractive to that righteousness that's not self-righteousness, but it's God's righteousness. Last but not least, I see the education in this argument. In verse 23, he just sums up what it's all about. And he that doubteth is damned if he eateth. But he that eateth not of faith for whosoever for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You know what they're saying? Paul's educating the believers about right and wrong conduct. All conduct should be controlled by faith. And of faith means this. It's according to what God instructs. And folks, this is the whole key. If it's not in this Bible, then it's not right. And if it's in this Bible, it's absolute truth. And if you don't have Bible for it, stop going around trying to flaunt some kind of rule and regulation that's not biblical. Just stay with the book. Stay with the Bible. Folks, of faith means it's according to the way God instructs. And if it's not according to God's way, then it's sin. And so here's the bottom line. Let's be patient with new converts. Let's be patient with them. And let's teach and lead by example. That's the final statement I want to give you. Let's be patient. Like God's patient with you. Let's be loving. Like a loving father. A loving grandfather. Because you know something? They are just kids. And they got to grow. And it's going to take a lot of patience. We don't need to put them down and we don't need to rebuke them every time they come to church, you know, popping gum and wearing dug gap jerseys. 
There's a whole lot more worse things they could be wearing. If they wear Metallica, I'll tell them, please, you know, we'll buy you a shirt. But let's be patient. Let's be loving. Let's be kind. Because life's more than, than meat and drink, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know what I want to be? I want to be the best Christian somebody knows. And I want to be the most edifying Christian that somebody knows. And one time somebody told me this, and, and I've never forgot it. They said, you know, you're an encourager. And I really didn't realize I was trying to encourage anybody. But he was talking about it with other preachers. And, you know, I can find fault with a lot of preachers around here. Just like you can. Some of you will find, maybe find fault with me. But you know what? I want to see potential in them. And I want to lead them uh, in a way of saying, hey, listen, you can do it. Don't quit. Please don't quit. Live for God. And, 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 and you'll make it. And, and God's worth it, no matter what you're going through. And me and my friends have even committed suicide in the ministry. And folks, what we need to be is an exhorter, an edifier, an encourager to those Let's pray. Father, thank you for this chapter. It's a very unusual chapter for the book of Romans, but it's really not unusual. It's just exactly what you want because it's the infallible, inspired, preserved word. Lord, we've had 11 great chapters of doctrine. And now in chapter 12 and chapter 13 and chapter 14, we have some instructions on daily living. And so, Lord, help love conquer it all. God, let patience be from the Lord. And help us, God, to forgive like Jesus forgives. And love like you love. And God, be patient with those that are just growing, that are just children in the Lord. God, may we help these new converts grow and glorify you, which is the bottom line. And we'll praise you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a brief word of testimony or maybe invitation. How many say, Preacher, I know some weak Christians, and I know some carnal Christians, and I know some new Christians. And by the grace of God, I want to be what Paul exhorted these Christians to be. I want to be an encouragement to them. I want to be an example to them without compromise. And I want to see them come to maturity. And I want you to pray with me for them. Would you slip your hand up on their behalf all over this auditorium? Father, thank you for these wonderful people that's come tonight. Lord, they didn't have to come, but they chose to come. And Lord, I know it's hot, and I know they've had rough days, and some of them worked in some very hot situations, and, and they're very tired. But I pray, God, they got something from God tonight. I believe, I hope the Word of God spoke to their heart. Lord, I pray that we were exhorted and challenged and stirred to reach our loved ones that are young in the Lord, that are carnal, maybe they're even lost. God, may we set the example for them of godliness and love, peace and joy of the Holy Ghost. We'll thank you for, for the privilege of being a reflection, a city set up on a hilltop, salt in a tasteless world. Glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray.